in the service of the King. Every talent I will bring, I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. That song that was part of the song that I sing when we get started. When I look on his face, beautiful face, born shadowed face, by and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more, more, so much more. More of my life than I e'er gave before. By and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more. By and by, when he holds out his hands, welcoming hands, nail-riven hands. By and by, when he holds out his hands, I'll wish I had given him more, more, so much more, more of my love than I e'er gave before. By and by, when he holds out his hands, I'll wish I had given him more. In the light of that heavenly place, light from his face, Beautiful face in the light of that heavenly place. I'll wish I had given him more, more, so much more. Treasures unbounded for him I adore. By and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more. First Corinthians, chapter 9. <clears throat> First Corinthians, chapter 9. Volume has gone up. Quite a bit. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. All right. Well, well, hopefully we don't get too many echoes. When I shout, it echoes, and I, you guys may not hear it, but back here, it's like I hear my voice come back to me three times after I, <laughs> after I shout, and I might shout a couple times. All right. First Corinthians chapter nine. We're going to begin in verse number twenty-four. <clears throat> Matter of fact, here's what I'll do. I'll turn that off. So that it's just this, and that way this doesn't pick up that, and then it bounces and all that. So we'll see how that works on the video. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter nine, verse number twenty-four. Last time I preached this, the title was "Sometimes You Have to Beat Yourself." Today the title is a little different. The title is "Run." <clears throat> Verse 24, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. 
and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subject, subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Turn over to Philippians chapter 3. When you get there, say amen. Wow, that was fast. Y'all beat me. Right there, yeah. Philippians chapter 3. I was looking down at my notes. Amen. Let's pray and then we'll jump into Philippians chapter 3. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you so much for the privilege to open it today and to break the bread of life. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts. Father, we pray that uh, as we've named today Revival Sunday, Lord, we pray that we would have revival in each of our lives, Lord, that, uh, that you would wake us up and bring us back to normal Christianity. Not normal Christianity that's normal for everyone else, but normal that's normal for you. And so, Lord, we pray, Father, that we would uh, begin to, to learn how we might run the race that's set before us. And, Lord, uh, may we be able to say at the end at the end that uh, we have finished our course. And, and uh, Lord, we pray, Father, that you would just bless this time now, and we look forward to all that you're going to do. We pray that you'd be glorified and that you would be the one in control. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse number 4. Paul says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, I, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I, might, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the res resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already made perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if, any, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. There's much more here, but I want to get... The, the, the setting here or the, the, uh, the stage set so that we recognize that Paul here was a runner. And I, when I say this, I don't mean that Paul was, was an athlete. I mean that Paul was a runner when it came to the, the ministry and when it came to the preaching of the gospel and to the edifying of the body of Christ. He was a runner. He was one that, that saw the mark ahead of him. He saw the goal uh, at the end of his life. And as he saw the goal, he ran with all of his might to do what he needed to do. Turn to Hebrews. I did not put this in my notes, but it just came to my mind. Hebrews uh, chapter number 12. After the Lord gives us the hall of faith and he tells us of all of those who had run in the faith and who had done all of these things by faith, he says, wherefore, in verse number 1 of chapter 12, seeing we are also, I'm sorry, seeing also, my goodness, let me read it right, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, think about that, 
talked about that in relation to the mark. I pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The joy that was set before him, that mark, that joy that was set before him, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul lays the groundwork for what he's about to tell the Corinthians. He wants them to run as he's running. And just the same today, I hope that, that each of us desire to be running, just like the Apostle Paul was running. Uh, he says in verse number 1, as he's laying the groundwork, he's going to deal with the fact of his apostleship, the power that he has to eat and drink and be married. And the, and, and the, the then in, in verses uh, 6 through 11, he's going to deal with the power that he has to reap their carnal things and all this. But he, he's giving this groundwork so that he can show them some of the things that, they ha that he has had to set aside for the sake of running the race. He says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord are not ye my work in the Lord if I be not an apostle unto others yea doubtless I am to you for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord mine answer to them that do examine me is this have we not power to eat or drink have we not power to lead about a sister a wife and other as well as other apostles as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas or before I go on I'll, he, he says he says, look, I, I, you guys see who, you know who I am. You know what I'm doing. You know uh, what I'm about. And he says, look, to those that examine me, those that are looking, looking on me with a microscope and trying to say uh, this or that about me and about the ministry that I'm doing, he says, let, let me ask this question. He says, don't we have the power or the ability or the, the, the liberty to, to, uh, to lead about a wife and, and to eat and drink? And uh, don't we have the power to do that just as others do? He says, or... Then in verse 6, he says, Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? And he, and he kind of elaborates on that a little bit. He says, look, we have the ability. We have the liberty. He says, go with the, uh, uh, who goeth the warfare at any time at his own charges? Who planteth the vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law also? Saith not the law the same also? He says, for it is written... In the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the, uh, uh, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. A few verses that go along with this is Jesus sent out the 70 to preach. He said that the workman is worthy of his meat in Matthew chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, he, he told them not to take gold or silver or brass in their purses, uh, nor script or for their journey, neither two coats nor shoes, yet, uh, uh, nor yet uh, staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, he says, uh, and in the same house remain, this is as they're out preaching, he says, in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give for the, worther, for the work, for the laborer, is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. And then when he's speaking, uh, and when, when Paul is speaking of elders uh, to Timothy, uh, that are he's speaking to Timothy about elders that are ruling and and uh, and so on. He says uh, in in chapter five of First Timothy, verse seventeen and eighteen, he says, "Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they that labor, they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth, treadeth out the corn, for the labor is worthy." My goodness, I am just I'm going to slow down, I guess. And the laborer is worthy of his reward. Is everybody catching every word or maybe every third word? I'm, I'm, there's a lot of scripture here that I'm reading, so I'm trying to move a little quickly. Um, and I know, you know, we're going to start smelling the food and everybody's going to be affected and it's going to be hard to run uh, in this, uh, in, in, in listening. So he, he gives us this understanding. He also praises the Philippians for their giving in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. He says, I'm, I'm just going to touch on a couple of points that he says there. He, he says that uh, their care flourished to him again in verse number 10. In verse number 11, he says that he didn't speak with, in respect of want. It's not that he wanted 
some things, and but they 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 gave anyways, and uh, he he says he he learned how to be content in whatever state he's in. But he says that they did well in verse number fourteen that they did communicate with his affliction, meaning that they gave to his need. And uh, he said in verse number fifteen that no church communicated with him as concerning giving and receiving, but them at that time. And and he says uh, he he said that they did so. He he. Uh, he enjoyed it, but in verse number 17, he says, Not because I desire a gift, but that I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And so this this concept, he praises the, the Philippians for what they had given for him. Um, and we're, we're going to hit a little bit more on this as we go through, because he's dealing with an issue here that the Corinthians had not uh, been giving to take care of Paul's need. And there was a reason for that. It was because Paul was not allowing it. And uh, and and they and the the reason that he didn't allow it is so that he could run his race, because running the race in Corinth meant keeping them from giving. Because, well, we'll talk a little more about it as we get down through the passage. But he says in verse number uh, eleven, he says, uh, "If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing?" If we shall reap your carnal things, if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. He, he, he says, listen, we, we didn't use this power. He, he says, we have the power. We have the liberty to do so. We, you owe us this, but we did not use it because we didn't want to hinder the gospel of Christ. The Corinthians were rich. They had money. And Paul didn't want them to feel as though they were without need because they were just taking care of him. So the money aspect he, he, he left alone. He says, uh, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. He says, but I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things that I should, or that it should be done unto me, for if, uh, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if I but if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? This is contextually speaking of the Corinthians. What is my reward when I'm preaching the gospel to you, Corinthians? He says that, or verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the, the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Uh, now, I, I don't want to get off on a rabbit trail on this, but basically what he's dealing with here is the false teachers that were among them at this time, they were charging for their services. Uh, it's one thing for the people to take care of the man of God. It's, it's another thing altogether for the man of God to charge them. Okay, so it's it's like uh, it's kind of like, you know, I get up and I say, all right, I preached this morning. Here's your bill. <laughs> no it's alright to take care of the man of God it's not alright for the man of God to do his services for filthy lucre okay the, the, now the man of God's going to benefit as as it says it even calls him an ox right no it, it says uh, that God says this so that he that ploweth should plow in hope meaning that the, the guy that's that's the, the, the preacher, the, the, the man who's sowing spiritual things, he's going to reap uh, those carnal things, and his needs will be provided for, but he doesn't do it for that purpose. And that's what was going on in Corinth. There were people that were there just to earn a living. That's the hireling that Jesus spoke of. Uh, the, the good shepherd or a, a good shepherd will care for the sheep. Now, of course, he's going to, uh, eat of the milk of the flock, and of course he's going to to be, um, of course he's going to benefit from the wool. Of course he's going to benefit in those ways, but that's not why he's there. He's 
there to run the race. And the race for those people was that they might be saved and that they might grow in grace. And so he says that he's not going to do this. He says, he, he explains in this passage that we just read through that he did not reap from them. And he, he, he tells us why and how. So he said in verse 12, he said, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Um, this is why he didn't, because for them particularly, it would have hindered the gospel. The next thing, how? He says, so, so how did he go to the Corinthians, and how did he spend the time there in Corinth? He spent a year and a half in Corinth, a bit longer than he spent in other places. How did he survive while he was there? if he wasn't receiving from them. Well, he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 7, sorry, 7 through 12, especially verse number 8, he says, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do service to you, or to do you service. It doesn't mean that he went to other churches and you know pulled his gun out and said, give me all your money. No. No, he was doing service to the Corinthians, and while he was doing service to the Corinthians, the Philippians and those of Macedonia were giving to his needs while he was in Corinth. So he said that he robbed other churches because they were caring for his needs. But he said in verse 12 of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, uh, What I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. So he says, I, I, I did this because I did not want to allow them to have an occasion against me. A, 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 an opportunity to say something against me. In, uh, in chapter 12, though, of the same book, he apologizes to them for it. Specifically in verse number 13, he says, for what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. He apologizes to him for not taking. But at the same time, he was kind of, he was, he was being a little, oh, by the way, Paul writes some sarcasm into this writing. And he, he has a lot of hyperbole and things, that, especially with the Corinthians, especially with the Corinthians, and a little with the Galatians as well. I don't believe that he was, actually asking their forgiveness for this. But at the same time, he was kind of like putting it back in their face, saying, look, I wasn't burdensome to you. Hey, forgive me for that. You know, I've done you wrong. I should have I should have been burdensome to you. He says, that's the only difference between you and other churches is I didn't take any of your money. <laughs> and he's, so, but he, he, he says this to them, but he abstained to run well concerning the Corinthians. Um, verse number 19. It says, Though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Unto the Jews, I became as a Jew, and that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, not being without law to God, but under the law to Christ that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Before we go on, don't misunderstand this. He's not saying, hey, to the tattooed, I tattooed myself. To the to the, the, the people that, that listen to rock music, I went and listened to rock music. To the, the people that, uh, that uh, you know, colored their hair all kinds of crazy colors, I went and colored my hair all kinds of crazy colors. To the people that wore the cut-off shorts, you know, the, the bell-bottoms and all that stuff, and the, to, the, to the heathen, I became a heathen. No, he's not saying that. He's saying where there was a higher standard, I went there. Where I needed to go and not receive of their money or their goods or any of that, I did it, he said. When I went to Corinth, they had everything they needed. I wasn't going to let them take care of me. 
because I did it for the gospel's sake. I didn't want to hinder the gospel of Christ because for them, again, they would take that, they would take that, uh, you know, you know what it's like. Maybe you don't. I don't know. Somebody that, somebody that's rich. Does anybody, does anybody know any any wealthy people? Not necessarily rich, but wealthy people like somebody that, somebody that doesn't mind giving, but maybe when they give, and of course it's usually the poor people that can give more. Um, but but when the when the wealthy give, what is often attached to that giving? There's a string attached to that giving. Usually they want notoriety for it, or they want to write it off on their taxes, <laughs> or maybe they maybe they just wanted to give so that they could control. Sometimes people give like more than you could even like expect. You know, there, there, there have been people who have, who have uh, mentioned, uh, well, you know, you could do this or that or whatever, and this would, you know, maybe like take care of, you know, you could get a building this way or you could do this this way or whatever. But understand that when when someone gives like that, when when you're poor or you're like in Paul's case, he lives day to day. If the Corinthians were giving to him, they would feel as though he had some obligation to serve them in a certain way. He wanted them to know that even without them giving, he was going to serve them the way that he should. Serve the Lord the way that he should and thereby serve them. Does that make sense? This is why it was an issue in Corinth. But he gave that up and God took care of him through the Philippians. God took care of him through the Thessalonians. God took care of him through those of Macedonia. And as God was taking care of him through them, he challenged the Corinthians the same. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Look, you, you, you're gonna. I, I, this is. I didn't even think about this at all. But we did a, a tactical shoot. What were we doing? We were running. My knees still hurt. My thighs hurt. My calves hurt. My feet hurt. What's that? Yes, yes. He was running. Uh, <laughs> amen. We ran, and. Some of us only ran for four minutes. Some of us ran for less than four minutes. Some of us, well, a couple of people, I mean, they didn't run the whole time, but they, they went for almost eight minutes. But we were on a course, and we had a, a goal. We had a finish line. And on that course, and in that the, the goal and the finish line, it was a tactical shoot run. And, and so you run to the first station. You cross the orange line, and then you can draw your weapon, and then you Get on target. You fire on target. You, you're trying to hit the target on the bullseye, and then you put your weapon away, and then you, you, you holster it, and then you run to the next station, and then you take aim, and you fire, and then and and so all the way through, and you're going to the finish line. You know, there's some things that some people had to give up as they began as before they started to run. Some people had to give up what weapon they would use because of the race that was set before them. The race that was set before them required more ammunition than they had available. Some of them used mine because mine fired 17 rounds. And so you only had to change the clip once, and they could do the whole course in two clips, two mags. But the the two two other people that did that, they gave something up for that. Now, one of them actually got second place. But... If you watch the video that we took of him, you'll see that uh, that he had a hard time holstering and unholstering because he wasn't used to the holster and the weapon and all that. But he he ran the course. He gave something up though, but he ran the course. Sometimes sometimes you do have to give something up for the betterment of you know the the full course. So in 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 his case, he gave up a gun that he was comfortable with. For a gun that he wasn't comfortable with because of the 
the convenience of being able to switch out and have ammo right away. Otherwise, he would have had to fill a magazine on his way to between one stop and another stop. That would be quite an extra amount of time. In fact, there was one guy that did have to do that. He, he had to stop and pull out his mag and pull out, and, and he had to wear a, a coat because he didn't have pockets that would hold the ammo. So he had a coat on with the ammo in the pockets and then the mag. And so he gets to the station. He's like, oh, I'm out. Pull the thing out, holster, and fill it up. And then put it back in and then go. Well, that took a lot of time. Now, we gave him a handicap for it because he was ill-prepared. But in reality, in a real-life situation, you wouldn't have that time. So you, what do you do? You prepare for the course. As Hebrews chapter 12 said, you lay aside the weight. Right, brother, the evangelist to or the, the, the missionary to Japan, he said, what did he do? He, uh, he took off his jacket and left it there. He laid aside the weight that would keep him from running the race uh, properly. Maybe I could have laid aside my Crocs and done a little better. Okay. Or brother Luke maybe could have laid aside his Crocs and maybe he would have got first place. He ran to that first target, and as he's running to that first target, he goes to stop, and his feet go, Shoo! and he goes, Shoo! right up to it. I mean, you know, he didn't have to, like, it, it saved him four or five steps. He just slid the rest away. But but, uh, but he was he was running the race. And some things, again, when you're running a race, sometimes you have to set some things aside <clears throat> to win. This race we're running, it's not against each other. This race we're running is running to do the best that you can do. Not better than the next guy. You can't look around and say, well, I'm not sinning as much as him, or I'm not sinning as much as her, or I go to church more than he does, or I go to church more than she does, and I go soul winning and he doesn't, or I go, I, I hand out tracts and she doesn't, or I, I read my Bible every day and so and so doesn't. It doesn't matter what other people are doing. The race you're running is your race. You have a different course than they do. In this particular case, he gives an example. He says that uh, they that run in a race, they all run. They run all, but one receiveth the prize. He says, so run that ye may obtain. He says, everyone that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. So temperance is, a, is an awesome thing. We could spend a whole message on temperance. You know, to be tempered is good. The bad thing is, it, it is a good thing to have a temper. Everybody should have a temper. And you should never lose your temper. You see, the temper is what holds you together in times of pressure and difficulty. Temperance is when God puts you in the fire, like, like, a, like a, um, a blacksmith would put a, a sword in the fire, and he would heat it up, and then he would put it in the water and cool it down. And then he would put it in the fire and heat it up, and put it in the water and cool it down. It's got to be the right kind of metal, or it'll get brittle and break. It's got to be the right temperature and then the right the right uh, speed in cooling. If it's cooled too fast, then it could damage the metal. But that process is a process of tempering that metal. It's making it stronger, making it more capable of withstanding the battle that's coming ahead. And so if you're going to strive for the masteries, what do you do? You temper yourself. How do you temper yourself? Well, by the Spirit of God. Spirit of God puts you in those situations, and when, you know, I'm going to use a, I'm going to use a, a quote from some, from some lost, crazy, you know, some, some, some politician, all right, that said, never waste. What was it? How did he say it? Never waste a catastrophe. I think he said or something. Speaking of like things like. 9-11 or speaking of things like, you know, and they would use that as an excuse. Now we have a good reason that we can tighten our grip, that we can get more control, right? Never waste a good problem. Well, you know what? There's some truth in that. Not just politically, but in your life. Don't waste your trial. When you get in a trial, Absolutely, positively, don't waste it. It's there to temper you. When you're having a hard time, endure the fire because God's going to take you out. He's going to cool you off. And he 
it's going to allow you some time to heal. It's going to go back in the fire. Someday, the fire is over and the battle starts. And it's important that you're tempered in that day. When you're striving for the mastery and you're swung around, you know, just like a sword, you're swung this way and that way, and you clang against the other sword. Now, remember, you're not the one swinging the sword. You're the sword in this particular example. And you hit what you're going, what, what the target is, whether it's another sword or or the enemy. Hit the target. Correctly tempered. You don't break. You do what you're supposed to do. This is the problem with many Christians today, with many churches today. There's no temperance when the Supreme Court rules that uh, that it that it's that it's not against the, or that it's unlawful to ban uh, sodomite marriages. Many Christians, many pastors, will break when it comes time to be put in the battle. Now, I'm not talking about you know a, a physical. We're not talking about a physical fist fight and going out and fighting the the sodomites or anything. We're talking about when the battle comes. Some people are going to fold under the pressure. Some people are going to break under the pressure. Because they're not tempered. They're not ready. Paul said, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Every one of us are going to suffer persecution if we live godly. If we live according to the Lord. So, what's the answer? Don't live godly? No. Because then we're going to be, I mean, would you rather fall under the hand of man or under the hand of God when it comes to, I mean, you, you, can, you can either go, uh, go into the battle and be temperate and take whatever it is that God has you going through, or you can go, or you can say, I just won't be godly, and then everybody will like me and I won't get persecuted. So then I have to answer to God in eternity for what I did. And we're not talking about going to hell. We're just talking about when you stand before God, you give an account of your life. We want to stand before God saying that we've run our race. We're going to get there in just a second. But if you're striving for the mastery, temperate, you're going to go through trials. He's already dealt with that, right? The fire will try the church. It's going to try you individually as well. Remember, as he said, as Peter said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Don't, don't think it to be strange. Endure temptation. Endure. He says that uh, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own, let's see, no, 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 before that, it says uh, in James chapter 1, I didn't want to turn there, but I can't remember how it goes, he says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him, we endure, endure, see, Paul put aside that little thing. There's some things that you and I may have to put aside. There's some things that we may have to do that may not be easy for us to do. He says to run three times in three verses. <clears throat> Verse 24, he says, run that you may obtain. He says, in verse number 26, he says, therefore so run. Oh, wait a minute, I skipped the part of the verse. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. That's exciting. We have reward in heaven because of our race that won't be corrupted. We have rewards in heaven that moth and rust cannot corrupt, and no thieves can break through and steal. If we run the race that we may obtain. 
another passage that I didn't include in here. Um, see if I if I can easily find it, I will bring bring it to light here. Second Timothy chapter two, and that's good. You can turn there because we're going to go to Second Timothy chapter four also. Kind of wrap it up as we finish. <clears throat> Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He didn't say be be strong in your own strength. Be strong in your stubbornness, or be strong in your abilities, or in your will. No, he said, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast. Uh, heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also thou therefore endure hardness endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier and if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. There's more, but I'll stop there. This is the point that I wanted to get from it. As we strive, as we run in our race, we do so lawfully, according to God's rules. We can't get there by taking a shortcut. We have to be temperate. We have to put aside. He said, what did he say? I, I spoke about the weight, right? The jacket the guy took off and, and all that. But I didn't speak about the other thing that he gave in, first, or in uh, Hebrews chapter 12. He said, and the sin. He said, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. See, there's sin that very easily will surround us and besiege us and keep us from winning, keep us from running the race. There's sin that very, each of us have sin that is a besetting sin, a sin that surrounds us that has to be killed, that has to be destroyed so that we can run with patience the race that is set before us. So that we can, and, and how, do we, how do we kill it? How do we lay it aside? It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So we set that aside and run with patience the race that's set before us. He says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, because he knows where he's going. He knows where the, where the end is. He knows the course. He's running, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. My punches land right where they're supposed to. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by let, yet lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. If you look at Second uh, Timothy chapter four, Paul ran his race and he encouraged everyone he spoke to to run like he did, like he ran by the grace of God. Paul ran by the grace of God the way that he should have run. And we have most of our New Testament because of it. God used the Apostle Paul to write most of your New Testament because he ran the race. God gave him grace to run the race. So, second, I'm sorry, Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Ask yourself, are you running the race? Have you set aside the weights and the sin that so easily besets you? Will you be able to say, 
with your last breath or with the last communication you have with people, I am ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Will you be able to say that? Sometimes we have to lay things aside. Sometimes we have to forego things that are even due to us, like Paul did. He had he could have received from the Corinthians, but he laid it aside so that he could run the race for them to be saved. Will you be able to say that you fought a good fight, finished your course, kept the faith? Hope so. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would just help us, Father, to be able to say in that day that we have fought a good fight, that we have finished our course, that we have kept the faith, rather than as we stand before you, as as it's on the song this morning, that we'll wish we had given you more. Oh, of course, we'll, as we look back on our lives today, we absolutely wish that we had given you more up to this point. Lord, may it not be said that we wished we had given you more toward the end because we've been given the message from your word to, to run, to strive temperately, to, to, to be temperate in, in all things and to be ready to lay aside the things that, that may hinder the run. Lord, may we say, may, may we hear when we stand before you, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Lord, we pray that you'd meet with us now for this. We're just going to take a moment to meet with you. And Lord, we just pray, Father, that you would deal with each of our hearts. Lord, help us, Father, to commit today that we will run. Father, we pray, Lord, that uh, you would get glory out of each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to go ahead and have a moment of prayer.